thank you very much for that introduction. And uh, very good evening, everyone. It's lovely to be with you all here um, this evening. Let's just um, make sure that we're on there. So we've just had that reading of Isaiah chapter 11. And I'd like to start, really, with this passage of Scripture, if I may. It's from the prophet Amos. And Amos says, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants the prophet, the prophets. A fascinating little verse. What what it's saying to us is that the purpose and the plan of God is so wonderful, it's so large in scale and enormity, that it's beyond the imagination of man to even contemplate or to identify what that plan is. And therefore, It's been necessary for God to reveal his purpose and to reveal his plan through the inspiration that he's given to his prophets. And they have set out for us that plan and purpose that we might understand. And in understanding it, we might respond to his message. So... The subject this evening is revealing God's plan, revealing God's plan for the future. And um, the structure of the talk is as follows. What I'd like to do to begin with is just summarize the lecture program that's been put together um, as part of this these series of talks that you've been invited to, just to provide a context to this evening. Then I'd like to just talk through with you God's plan for the future, which is really my words um, from based on reading of the scriptures over some several years. And then I would like to look at a summary provided by scripture itself and then use that summary as a sort of like a coat hanger so that you've got an overall picture of the plan going forward and then provide you with some more detail that you can hang on to that uh, coat hanger, and um, and then we'll ask the question: How can we participate in God's plan, and then make some conclusions? So that's the that's the structure of this evening. So summary of the lecture program: the lecture program is consisting of three three lectures. The first was the prophecies that have been fulfilled in the past. The second one, which was last week, was the prophecies fulfilled today and and in the modern era and this evening is the prophecies the prophecies that explain God's plan for the future so there's there's an integrity there to to the overall plan and we're going to draw heavily and have been drawing heavily upon the prophets and their revealed message to mankind so just as a starter for tonight why can we believe the Bible, because that, that's the underlying theme, isn't it? We have to have some sort of authority, and what we're trying to do is to establish that authority, which is the written word in front of us. So there's just some ideas for you to contemplate there. No man can tell the future. We don't even know what's going to happen two years, two hours from now, uh, look alone two centuries from now. So only God can do this, and therefore it's a major evidence that the Bible is from God, that God has set this message out, that sets out the things that will happen in the future. Those two earlier lectures saw many prophecies that have been realized, and they've been explained to you, and that's evidence of the uh, veracity of Scripture. And uh, as I've already said, the plan of God is far too wonderful to be the thoughts of man. And hopefully you'll get the essence of that uh, this evening as we go through some passages of scripture. And this evening we shall see that the steps toward implementing God's plan for the future are logical. And that the message contained in scripture is consistent across the whole of the Bible. And that integrity and that logic is very, very important in terms of validating its authenticity. 
We can also see today the alignment of the nations in the world positioning themselves as described by the Bible. And this is very, very remarkable. We have the return of natural Israel partially regathered back into their own land, the land of Israel, and they've gone back in unbelief. All those things have been prophesied in Scripture. We see Western Europe, and I'm going to introduce a little term here, which is referred to in Revelation as the beast, has developed strong links with Gog of the land of Magog, which I will um, hopefully show is Kiev and the Ukraine. And uh, that, I think, is a remarkable development. And Britain has removed herself from the EU, which is the western leg of the Roman beast, just as expected. These are remarkable things that are happening in our newspapers in our own, in our own day. So, God's plan for the future. Well, God's plan for the future, put very succinctly, is to fill this earth with God's glory. That's, that's quite uh, uh, probably an unexpected thought that, 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 that I've just put to you, but to fill the earth with God's glory. That, that glory is God's character, and it places emphasis upon mercy, compassion, and loving kindness. That, that glory... The glory of character is summed up in God's name, God's memorial name, which is Yahweh. So the earth is going to be filled with the name of Yahweh. Loving kindness, mercy, and compassion. That's God's plan for the future. And it will be established in several steps, but the first major step, of achieving this will be establishing God's kingdom upon the earth. And God's kingdom upon the earth will be um, established and will continue and remain for a thousand years, referred to as the millennial age. It will be ruled over by Jesus the Christ, and that word Christ means king, who is the express image of his father's character. Hopefully you're beginning to see the idea of how this purpose of God will be achieved. Jesus is the express image, the character of God in the flesh as it were, when he came and he received the name of God as an inheritance. The people or the saints called out by God and sanctified in Christ, in other words, baptized into the Lord Jesus Christ over successive generations will be raised from the dead and those remaining alive will be gathered together with Christ and taken to the judgment seat. They have been instructed in the word of God or are being instructed in the word of God. They have striven to develop the character of God during their period of mortal probation. And consequently, they are described as having the name of God or the character of God written in their foreheads. The thinking part of the brain has got the imprint of the character of God as a result of reading the word of God. Uh, these people will receive immortality at the judgment seat and shall rule with Christ for a thousand years. The people and nations, in other words, the mortal population that remain on the earth will be ruled over by Christ and the saints. God's righteousness will bring forth peace and harmony for the mortal population that remain, and there will be a fruitfulness and abundance in the earth never seen before. The great work and role of the saints in the millennium age will be to teach the mortal population the ways of God, that they too might have the imprint of the character of God. And after the thousand years has been completed, there will be a second resurrection of the mortal population that lived during the millennial age. After this second resurrection, we are told that death will be abolished and that God will be all in all. 
There's very, very little information about this final stage of God being all in all, but we'll have a look at it this evening if, if there's time. Um, and we can be assured, though, that at that stage, it'll be even more wonderful than the millennial age of the kingdom. That's a little summary. There's an enormous amount of information there to take in. Um, hopefully, as we go through this evening, some of that will be um, uh, uh, endorsed and you'll have a, a framework to hang all that information on. So steps in the implementation of God's plan for the future. Well, I'd like you to turn with me, please, to the first of Corinthians and chapter 15, because this is not luck, but excuse expression, as luck would have it, it by design, um, we have a passage of scripture that provides us with a little summary of the future steps towards the implementation of God's plan. This is a very important and very useful passage of scripture because it provides us with a solid base, a grounding, if you like, on what we can use um, to understand this subject. It's 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 20. <clears throat> We read there, and there's Paul writing to the believers at Corinth. He says, but now Christ is risen from the dead. And, and this is the start of the whole process. And has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ's at his coming. Then comes the end when he, Christ, delivers up the kingdom to God, the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he, that's Christ, must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death, for he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. In other words, God the Father is superior and supreme in authority in all things. Now when all these things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Now, that's a little summary from Scripture, um, which sets out some key stages, I would suggest. And uh, this table just tries to synthesize that so that we have some structure to this evening's talk. Step one is, verse 20, Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead and ascends into heaven. Stage two, Christ returns from heaven and the dead in Christ are raised. This is the first resurrection and given immortality. Step three, once the kingdom of God is established, Christ and the saints will bring the earth into subjection to God's rule. Step four, the last enemy destroyed in the kingdom is death. This refers to the second resurrection of the mortal population who have lived during that millennial age. And stage five, Jesus offers up the kingdom to God and God shall be all in all. So that, that's a little summary and that's the coat hanger to hang all the information on, I would suggest. So what we're going to do now, we're going to go through those steps, and we're going to drop on other passages of Scripture and bring them into these individual steps so we can see and fill those steps out and get a much fuller understanding of how this plan and purpose is going to work in practice. So, let's go to step one. Step one is fundamental. Without the resurrection of Christ, none of this happens. So the resurrection of Christ is 
absolutely pivotal to enabling this plan to move forward. In 1st of Corinthians chapter 15, we're there at the moment, we read there in verse 3, he says, For I delivered to you first of all that which also I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. Here is the witness that Paul is reiterating back to the Corinthians to say, you know it's an absolute proof Christ has been raised from the dead. In the epistle to Romans, and um, the words are actually on the, on, the, on the page there, on the slide, concerning his son Jesus, Paul writes, he was declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. In other words, the very power of his resurrection and the fact that he was raised from the dead was evidence that he was sinless. It was evidence that he was indeed the son of God. In other words, it is a validation and a vindication of everything that the Lord Jesus Christ said about himself. In, again, um, 1 Corinthians 15, which we've already read, it said that there was the apostles and the witnesses who witnessed to his resurrection. We've just read that. And in Acts chapter 1, it's worth just um, having a quick look at this. In Acts chapter 1, after the resurrection and the 40 days that elapsed, <clears throat> just before the Lord Jesus Christ is taken up to heaven, they walk out from Jerusalem and they go to the Mount of Olives and they have a conversation. And um, we read there in verse 6, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked Jesus, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? An interesting question. You really, we need to have a, a, a quite a full understanding of Scripture to understand why they asked that question. They asked that question not in ignorance, but because they knew their Old Testaments. Under the Old Testament, the, 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 the kingdom of Israel was a type. It was a shadow of the kingdom, which is still yet future. The king was God. He had appointed David as the Messiah, his anointed, to rule in his place. There were the people. There was the law. There was the throne. There was the land. All these things constitute a physical reality to this kingdom. And it's going to be the same when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. Will you restore again the kingdom to Israel? Yes, it will be an Israelitish kingdom, and the throne will be established in Jerusalem. Step two, Christ will return from heaven. And uh, if you come with me to the book of Revelation, there's um, some very useful um, information concerning this uh, in the book of Revelation in chapter 16. I'd like to go in at verse 14, if I may. It says, For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So we introduced this idea, not for the first time, that there will be a great battle. This is still yet future to our own day. Verse 15 this is the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew, Armageddon. Now, he's not coming as a thief 
to the household of faith. To the world, the context is there in verse 14, to the world, they will be oblivious to the fact that he has returned. Albeit with mighty power, he will have returned unseen, unknown by the world, but very much known and understood by the household of faith. And if we go to the first letter of Thessalonians, we get further detail regarding this coming of the Lord Jesus Christ with power. First of Thessalonians, chapter 4. And I'm just going to read these verses to you, if I may. They're there in verse 13 through to the end of the chapter. The Apostle Paul has written this letter to the believers at Thessalonians. They know all about this and he is reinforcing the lessons that he's already given them. And he says, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. In other words, those who are dead, but they're not perished because they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. They have believed the gospel and therefore death is mere sleeping in the dust of the ground. That's what he means by that term. It's a scriptural term. Who have fallen asleep. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Notice the little terminology there, in Jesus. Those who are baptized into Jesus because they have believed the gospel message. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Now, that's a very clear passage of scripture, but there are a couple of points of further clarification I would like to bring to your attention. That phrase there in um, verse 17, where he says, uh, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together. I think there's a wrong emphasis there in terms of the translation, because the actual word means to be caught away to be pulled, to be taken. And um, there is an, uh, another example uh, of, of this, a very useful example. If you come with me to the um, Acts of the Apostles in chapter 8, we join Philip the evangelist there who's been instructed to go and preach the gospel to a eunuch who's on his way down to Ethiopia. He has ran and met the man, preached to him the truth, he has been baptized. He's gone down into the water for baptism. And then he is caught away. It's uh, there in verse 39. Just 38 for, for, for connection. It says, So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. That's the same word so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. He was snatched away and taken to a different location. The eunuch was oblivious to how this had happened, but it had happened. This is the power of the spirit. And that word spirit here clearly is referring to an angel that did this to transport Philip the evangelist away. And the same will happen here 
in Thessalonians, I would suggest. It's the same word. And the, the key thing to really focus in on is in verse 17. It says, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Uh, and the Lord will not be floating around the earth in some sort of mystical way. He, he's far too busy for that. He's actually going to establish the kingdom and the throne in Jerusalem. We know that from numerous passages of scripture and that's where the Lord will be and the saints who are raised from the dead will be with him in that uh, important role of establishing the kingdom. So we know that the saints are taken away and they'll be taken away for judgment and uh, we read in the second Corinthians chapter 5 it's there on the screen. It says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in his body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. There will be a judgment seat. We will have to give an account as being responsible for custodians of this message and uh, this wondrous uh, information that God has revealed to us. And at the judgment seat of Christ, those found worthy will be given immortality. And just drawing on that passage that we've looked at already, 1 Corinthians 15, it says, For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. And so the scripture teaches us very clearly that we are mortal. We are the potential of perishing. And that's why the gospel message has this name, the good news. It is the way of escape from total oblivion and perishing and death. And therefore, we are blessed if we have access to this gospel message and understand and have the courage and faith to respond to it. So step three. Well, we read Revelation chapter 16, verses 14 to 16, didn't we, just a few moments ago. And we were introduced to that idea that um, after the judgment seat, after the immortalization of the saints, there's going to be a battle. The, it's described as the great battle. It's the battle of Armageddon. And we're told there in Revelation that the uh, Battle of Armageddon is a Hebrew word, and therefore we need to go to the Hebrew lexicon to find out what it means. And there's three components to that word. It's armor, means heap of sheaves, G, which is valley, and don equals judgment. So in like a heap of sheaves, the nations will be brought down into a valley to be judged. Not just judged generally, but judged by God. And there will be great destruction because they will oppose the Lord Jesus Christ. And they will be seeking in this battle to destroy God's people, which is natural Israel. So the kingdom is established and all opposition will be destroyed, we read in um, that core reading. And the question is, where will this battle of Armageddon happen? Well, if we come with me to the prophecy of Joel, Joel is a, a minor prophet, a minor prophet with a major message, I would suggest. And in chapter 3, chapter 3 is all about Armageddon, and um, it tells us there where it's going to be um, based. So the center of Armageddon, this great battle, it says, verse 2, chapter 3, it says, I will also gather all nations, there it is, that little phrase, all nations, is a good indication, it's talking about Armageddon, all nations, and bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them there, on account of my people, my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations, they have also divided up my land. And we've seen the last 2,000 years, they did exactly that. They scattered um, Israel, and now they've been brought back uh, into the land. Now, that 
Valley of Jehoshaphat is interesting because the name Jehoshaphat means Jehovah judged. And the Valley of Jehoshaphat is the, is the Kidron Valley. It's the Kidron Valley, which runs just to the east of Jerusalem, running north-south, and then it deflects and it goes east down towards the Dead Sea. We'll see in a minute that that valley is not yet complete. There's another piece of the valley yet to be established. Um, and that valley, which is effectively around um, Jerusalem, in the Jerusalem area, um, is the area where this battle of Armageddon will take place. If we had time, we could go to Daniel chapter 11, and we would see that actually the scope of the area of conflict is much wider than just Jerusalem. It covers the whole of the Middle East and parts of Syria, um, but the destruction of the northern host that come down into the land will be focused around the area of Jerusalem. <clears throat> now, if you come with me to um, Ezekiel, um, there's a little bit more information provided for us uh, here about Armageddon. And uh, I'd just like to read a couple of these verses to you um, because what we've got here is a description of the northern confederacy of nations that will come down into the land of Israel seeking um, plunder um, and they will go down into Egypt, turn around, come back, um, plant their tents uh, in the mountains of Judah around Jerusalem and seek to destroy Jerusalem and seek to destroy Judah. It's at that time that Christ and the saints will intervene to deliver God's people, Israel. But just come with me, please, to Ezekiel chapter 38. We read there, verse 2, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I'm against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, and Meshach, and Tubal, I will turn you around, put hooks into your jaws, and lead you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all its troops, the house of Togarma from the far north, and all its troops, many people are with you. Prepare yourself and be ready you and all your companies that are gathered about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be visited in the latter years, that's yet future to our own day, you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people. I hope that's starting to resonate with you. We're talking about natural Israel. And gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel which had long been desolate, they were brought out of the nations, and now all of them dwell safely. Now, um, some analysis of these names and words um, have provided quite a lot of insight in terms of the formation of this northern power that's going to be leading the initiation of this great battle, Armageddon. Gog of the land of Magog is subject to quite a lot of discussion. But we read in um, Ezekiel chapter 39 that they are located to the north of Israel. And they are the Scythian people. And the Scythian people who are located north of Israel is Kiev and the Ukraine. And it's very, very interesting that Kiev and Ukraine has developed quite a relationship with Western Europe and are speaking the same language as each other. It's the language of democracy and it's the language of human rights. And that's exactly what the Bible um, has informed us that will happen towards the end. We have Rosh, Meshach and Tubal, which are the other Russians. And we know there's conflict there at the moment but that conflict will resolve itself, we believe, and the Russias 
will be united. Tugama is Turkey, Goma is Western Europe, particularly France, Italy, and Germany. Persia, which is Iran, Libya, Libya, Ethiopia equals Sudan. These nations will come together in this great confederacy and they will sweep down into the land, we're being told here, by Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. Um, I'd just like to share this with you because Zechariah 14 it, it provides us with more information. Zechariah chapter 14 tells us without any question or doubt that, Z uh, that Jerusalem is going to be the centre of this great battle. So if you come with me to Zechariah, Zechariah again is one of the minor prophets towards the end of the Old Testament. Zechariah chapter 14, we're told, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming and your spoil will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations, there it is, that little phrase again, all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, the women ravished, half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. The remnant will be delivered by Christ and the saints. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle, and in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half of it toward the south. Isn't it interesting that one of the major plate tectonic fault lines just happens to go through just north of Jerusalem and through the Mount of Olives. This, this whole event is just waiting to happen. That Valley of Jehoshaphat, the Kidron Valley, will be now linked up with this additional valley which will head east. And it is in that valley that the Gogian host will flee. And it is in that valley that the Gogian host will be destroyed. In Ezekiel 39 verse 4, we're told that Gog falls on the mountains of Israel. In Zechariah 14 and verse 5, we're told that they fall in the valley of the mountains. And that valley has been created by that seismic activity we've just described there for you. And in Ezekiel 38 verse 22, we're told that brimstone will rain down upon the Gogian host. And in Zechariah chapter 14, verses 12 to 13, we're told that their flesh shall, shall consume away. This is the battle of Armageddon in all its detail. Um, we haven't really got time to cover Isaiah, but um, just a, I'd just like to make a comment on this because the... Armageddon, the battle of Armageddon, is not the only battle of the kingdom. There will be a series of battles for the kingdom at the early stages. But if you come with me to Isaiah chapter 11, we have, as we read together, a little picture of Judah, Jerusalem, immediately after the battle of Armageddon. Armageddon is described for us in chapter 10 of Isaiah. We then have this beautiful picture of the establishment, the embryonic kingdom of God, with the Lord Jesus Christ as king, and the consequences for the world, the natural world, the harmony of the natural world, as well as harmony generally uh, in this area. Um, noting that in chapter uh, 11 verse 9 we read for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea uh, th then we have details of the sequence of events that will happen immediately after Armageddon so we're not left not knowing what's going to happen uh, verse 12 we read that the remnant of Israel will be regathered those in New York and other places in the world they will be regathered at this stage immediately after Armageddon. Ephraim and Judah will be brought together in unity in the hand of the Messiah. 
And then after the consolidation of the kingdom, the kingdom will be enlarged from Judah and we'll see a situation where the judgments of God will fall upon the nations round about that rejoice so much at the calamity of Israel when the Gogian host came down onto the land. They will be judged, particularly Edom and Moab and Ammon, all those nations round about. They will be judged and then there will be the allocation of the land to the um, tribes of Judah and Ephraim. In the book of Revelation, we have further details of other battles where the rest of the earth are also brought under subjection to the king, the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's go to step four. The last enemy destroyed will be death. And um, part of the um, work of the saints is set out for us in Psalm chapter 19. Um, if you come with me to Psalm 19, I don't believe it's actually speaking about the physical heavens and the physical uh, sun, etc. I think this is talking about this, the, the new political heavens that will be established at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says there, the heavens declare the glory of God. There it is. That's the purpose. And the heavens, that is the Lord Jesus Christ and his saints who've been instructed in the word, will declare the glory of God. The glory of God in terms of his compassion, his mercy, and his loving kindness, based upon which righteousness will be established. And the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech. Night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language there where their voice is not heard. This is worldwide preaching of the gospel message where their, their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run his race. The sun, the dominant light in this new political heavens is the Lord Jesus Christ. The stars are the saints. This is the work of the saints and the Lord Jesus Christ during that thousand years. But we're told that death is the final enemy and it is destroyed and it's set out there in the book of Revelation for us. Uh, let's just go there briefly. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not going to have time to comment on it. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. In other words, death itself is now destroyed as a consequence of this second resurrection that happens at the end of the millennial age. Entirely consistent with what we've read in the first of Corinthians chapter 15. There is an integrity and a logic here that is um, quite amazing. Step five, we read that Christ offers up the kingdom to his father and God is all in all. Well, we're just in Revelation. If you come to um, chapter 21, um, it's described for you there. This is the most extensive description I think we have of the all in all stage in the plan and purpose of God for the future. We're told that New Jerusalem, uh, which represents the constitution of things, noting this is a book of sign and symbol, New Jerusalem, the constitution of this new arrangement that's going to be put into place is what's being described there. It's of a heavenly character. Remember the Lord's Prayer. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And that's what's been 
um, set out for us here. The will of God becoming implemented in terms of the arrangements uh, on the earth. And we're told that God will dwell with men. And God is the husband here. His son and his people, the saints, and those raised at the second resurrection are his bride. And most importantly, we're told, there is no more pain, there is no more sorrow, and there is no more death. That is, as it were, the summation of God's future plan with this earth. So the question, everyone, is how do we participate in this glorious plan? Well, the Bible is God's invitation to each one of us to participate in God's plan for the future, which will fill this earth with his glory. In the Bible, God explains his purpose and it explains his plan. And crucially, God explains what he requires man to do. And if we were to go to Acts chapter 2, we have a worked example for us of such, just such an incident where these things became a reality. The Lord Jesus Christ has just ascended into heaven. The apostle uh, Peter um, has been given power from on high, the Holy Spirit gifts that he might preach and teach the things that he's learned from the Lord Jesus Christ as a prophet of God. And he stands up and he preaches the gospel to those who come to see a great miracle, which is these tongues of flames and fire that, that descended on the apostles when they received the spirit gifts. And he preached to them the gospel. And, and after, after preaching to them the gospel, that they, were, they were pricked in their hearts because they realized, as Israelites, because they were in Jerusalem, he, they realized as Israelites they had crucified their own Messiah. And they say, what shall we do? What shall we do? It's there in verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. In other words, the word of God had cut them. It had convicted them. And that is a necessary part of the process of being prepared. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, there is a first century context here. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all afar off as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls, 3,000 living beings, were added to them. So, how do we participate in God's plan for the future? Well, the question really is, will you, with a true and honest heart, accept God's invitation and his instruction to repent and to be baptized into the saving name of Jesus Christ. Everyone here prays that you will do so. Thank you for listening.